So I was thinking of a topic to pick, and I just kept going back to clinic with moms asking us questions about their babies all the time. Um, and so this is really, there's, I have several topics to talk about, um, just kind of going over them, not super in-depth, but because um, I wanted to hit a lot of different topics. Um, and I did have to trim some, because there was a lot that I could have talked about um, so I don't have any disclosures. Um, so, and my objectives are kind of general to cover all these topics. So hopefully um, you can recognize normal infant findings and be able to listen to parent concerns and answer them with up-to-date information. Also have lots of memes, so, <laughs> for comedic relief. Um, okay, so the first topic I wanted to talk about was a prenatal visit, which we don't do here, but they do in a lot of private practices where parents go to the pediatrician's office before they have a baby um, to meet the pediatrician and talk to them. Um, so really, pediatric care begins before the baby is born, um, and this is offered by a lot of private practices, but most parents don't go to it. I think the highest number I saw was maybe 10%. <clears throat> but it can be very beneficial in, in helping establish the initial relationship. Um, it's a good opportunity for parents to ask questions about the office and common practices, if they have questions about immunizations or what are the usual well child checks and things that typically happen um, at regular office visits. And obviously it's more important for first time parents or if they're new to the practice. I mean, if they have like five kids that come to see you, they probably don't need this. But, um, so, that's it. so some of the goals of these visits are to kind of start building the foundation for partnership. We're partners with parents. Um, you can do a lot of the history, like. Um, their OB history, their current prenatal history, any family history that would be important. Um, and then you can start doing anticipatory guidance before the baby's born about what's going to happen in the nursery. Um, you can talk about breastfeeding and skin to skin at birth, uh, their plans for childcare in the future. And um, that's about it. Um, so, it's also important to start identifying any psychosocial factors that m are going to affect how their family functions um, and get them help as soon as possible if you find any of that. So there's different types of visits. You can do like a full visit with the parents and do all this history and everything. You can do just like a get acquainted visit where they just come to meet you and ask any questions that they might have. And you can also do this over the phone. And fun fact, you can bill for it. So. If you're going to go into private practice, it's something to think about. Um, okay, so that's about it for that. Don't baby-proof your home like this. So. <laughs> okay, um, so my next topic is postpartum depression, which is very important. Um, it's, there's, it causes an increase, cost of medical care. Um, it leads to sometimes inappropriate medical treatment of the baby, um, discontinuation of breastfeeding, family dysfunction, um, and there's also an increased risk of abuse and neglect for the baby. And all of this adversely affects the infant's brain development, which is really important right after they're born. 
Um, also, dads can get postpartum depression. Um, so it's something to just think about. I know we don't see a lot of dads in our clinic, but um, if they're there, something to talk to them about too. Um, and the dads have an increased risk if the mom has postpartum depression. So this is what usually happens. If the mom has some kind of positive screen or um, <clears throat> discloses something and then nothing happens, they don't ever get evaluated for it, <clears throat> or they do get evaluated and diagnosed and they never get any treatment. So it's very important for us to pay attention to that and I know we don't have a whole lot of resources here, but it's important for us to try to get them some, some help. So it peaks at about six weeks um, after birth. Overall, about eight, 11 to 18 percent of women, but much higher in low income and teen moms, um, which is a big part of our patient population. So it's something we should be um, paying attention to. And a new article just came out from the AAP that postpartum depression is now considered an adverse childhood event. Important, very important. So it needs, we need urgent response. It's not something you just kind of wait around and see if it gets better. Um, <clears throat> and this new article recommends screening the mom at every well child visit until six months of age. Um, a lot of times the moms, especially if they've never met you or you know, you're still building your relationship, they're not going to disclose something at the first one or two visits, but maybe as they get to know you, they'll, they may feel more comfortable um, in telling you that they're having these feelings, and, um, and then you can intervene at that time. And a, a lot of the argument was that the mom is not our patient, the baby is our patient, but it's very important. The, the mother-baby dyad is very important in how they interact. So talking to the mom and <clears throat> um, getting this information from the, <coughs> from the mom, sorry, is very important um, for the health of the baby. Um, and then they also recommended screening pregnant moms when they come for sibling visits. So before they even have their baby, um, start talking to them about this. Some of the risk factors, we know these from being in the nursery and clinic. Um, they have a personal family history of depression, any substance use, they have family issues, chronic illnesses, um, poverty, and especially the young moms. So if you have a teen mom, please screen them. So I know this is hard to read, it's just an example. Um, Friday Clinic is actually using these um, surveys for postpartum depression. Um, they're 10 questions and it's, it's about their symptoms in the last week. So not how are they feeling today, but in the past week, have they um, been able to laugh? Have they enjoyed anything? Um, have they been anxious? Anything like that. And then obviously the most important thing is any thoughts of suicide um, or harming themselves or others. And if that occurs, obviously, they need to be in the ER as soon as possible. So you score this and um, each answer has a number assigned to it and if it's more than 10, then they have possible depression, which is something to kind of start working them up for and making sure they have some kind of follow-up for that. Um, okay, so I already talked about the dyad, but it's, this is two generations that are affected. So if the mom is affected and the baby um, will also be affected as they grow up. Um, and I know we don't have a whole lot of community resources, but we do have some places that we can refer them to. And while they're in the clinic, you want to promote protective factors. So. Um, if dad is not depressed, you can kind of like 
use that. They're, they act as a buffer um, to support the mom. Um, you definitely want to know that, let her know that she's not bad, she's not wrong, she's not like, none of this is her fault. Um, it's very common. And just continue to encourage her. Okay, so that's, that's that. Um, okay, so I want to talk about a little bit about umbilical cord care um, because it's done differently everywhere. So, um, it's, so obviously bacterial infections are very common. Um, it's the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in infants and the umbilical cord is the most common point of entry because the um, cord is a really good medium for bacteria to grow. Um, and worldwide, this is a huge issue. Here, it's not really so much. Um, and the most common organism is staph, but there's also E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas. Um, so some of the issues for getting an infection would be a home, unplanned home birth, low birth weight, um, premature rupture of membranes, umbilical artery catheterization and choreo, which most of this is what is NICU things that we see here. Um, but in other places, home births are common. So in other places in the world. Um, so the best practice is very controversial. Everybody says different things. Um, but if it's a clean delivery, they have sterile scissors with ster delivered with sterile gloves, everything's clean, then you can, you can do dry cord care where you don't put anything on it, you just let it dry up. Um, and what you teach the parents is to keep it clean, just let it be open to the air. Um, and they do sponge baths until it falls off, which is what we tell them anyway. And to kind of fold the diaper down so that it doesn't sit on top of it. Um, and then if it does get dirty or anything, they can just clean it with soap and water. Um, a lot of hospitals are using chlorhexidine, especially if it's if for home births um, or areas that have high neonatal mortality. Um, we use triple dye. And we also use, we instruct moms to use alcohol, which um, it's also not been proven to help or not help, so we don't really know um, if it works or not. But it does cause the cord to take a little bit longer to fall off. Um, so if you're going to do dry cord care, you definitely need to educate the parents about omphalitis, which is nasty. Um, they're going to have discharge, foul odor from the cord, red skin. Um, this is what it looks like. It's not pretty. It's kind of gross. Um, so the World Health Organization advocates for dry cord care. And the AAP says nothing has been, they don't really have an opinion. Um, so my opinion on this is we can keep teaching them to use alcohol, but if they come to clinic and they're like, oh no, I forgot to do that, it's okay. <laughs> it's not, they have so many things to keep, to keep track of with a newborn that it's not really the priority. Um, okay, bath time. So the first bath, um, this is a new thing we're doing, I think, I just, was on NICU and I saw a sign in the labor and delivery rooms <clears throat> telling the moms that we're not, we're not gonna routinely bathe infants until six hours after birth. Um, so obviously this helps with um, skin to skin and breastfeeding and bonding with their baby. Um, and then also the vernix is very important for newborns um, it prevents infections and it keeps their skin moist. So early bath time has shown that babies can get hypothermic and 
there's a risk of respiratory compromise. So if, if you can wait, it's, it's good to wait um, at least six hours. Um, obviously, if there's some kind of risk of bloodborne pathogens, they would need one sooner than that. Um, and if they have a million visitors, they can opt to have their baby bathed sooner. Um, or just have them wear, have the visitors wear like a gown and gloves while they're holding the baby. Um, and then while they're, as they get older, um, we've all had moms in clinic that are like, I bathe my baby five times a day. That's, you don't need that. <laughs> so babies don't really get dirty. Two to three times a week is more than enough. Um, and perfume and dye-free soap, which we always kind of recommend anyway. And obviously, we don't want to soak the cord until it falls off. And as they get, um, oh, the water temperature, so if they have a um, water heater that they can control, it should be set to less than 120 so that they can't scald the baby on accident. Um, and then as they get older, you don't leave them alone in the bathtub and make sure that it's completely empty when they are done with the bath. If they're mobile, you can get back to the water. Um, and just like common sense things, but sometimes you have to remind people of, like, don't leave electronic devices next to the tub, like their blow dryer or something, um, and remove any sharp objects, like as if they can start grabbing things. So make sure nothing is in their reach. In summary, <laughs> don't water hose your baby. Um, okay, circumcision. So a lot of our parents um, usually know what they want to do as far as circumcision goes, but um, in case they don't, it's important to know um, to know about it to be able to counsel them. So about 58 percent of newborns in the U.S are circumcised, this number is going down dramatically. Um, it used to be much higher. So <clears throat> ideally you would want parents, you would counsel them about this before delivery um, so that it can be done in the nursery or in the first few weeks of life. <coughs> um, some parents wait until they're want to wait till their son's older and let them decide, but obviously as they get older it's a much bigger procedure and you have to do general anesthesia and all that. Um, and there's more, it's associated with more um, complications. Um, and then there's always controversy, there's groups that don't even think circumcision should be an option for parents. So. Um, and then obviously there's some religious um, faiths that um, believe in circumcising over and not. So. so some of the pros of circumcision um, reduces the risk of HIV by 60%, which is huge. Um, that's the main, the main pro for um, getting circ circumcised. Um, it also reduces STDs by 30 to 40 percent, and um, there's better hygiene. Uncircumcised um, boys are harder to keep clean. There's increased risk of infection with phimosis and paraphimosis, and all that is painful and um, difficult to deal with. Um, they also have less risk of UTIs. And it's three to 12 times, uh, uncircumcised baby is three to 12 times more likely to get a UTI than a circumcised baby. And there's also less risk of cancer. Um, I think that kind of goes with the STD thing because it, it's really HPV that they're talking about. Um, cons, there's always risk with any procedure that you do, infection, bleeding. Um, there's risk of adhesions, so um, 
every now and then we get a parent that thinks their baby wasn't fully circumcised and it's really just adhesions. Um, they still have to be taught to kind of pull back the little skin that's left so that it doesn't get stuck. And then um, if they do have adhesions, they may need um, steroid cream or revision um, to fix it. Um, this, I don't think this is really an issue, but for the chunkier babies, they, you can get a hidden penis, which just as they get bigger, it resolves. It's just because they're chunky, so it kind of gets sucked in a little bit. <laughs> um, and, then, and then there's um, reduced sexual pleasure that people have been saying, but they've had studies um, of men that were circumcised as adults that said there was no difference. So, um, so World Health Organization supports circumcision in countries with high HIV rates because of the dramatic decrease in risk of um, getting HIV. And the AAP in 2012 said that the preventative benefits outweigh the risks and that it's a well-tolerated procedure with minimal complications um, and that um, the benefits are enough to justify third parties to pay for it, so insurance should pay for it, but they're not great enough benefits to, to recommend it for everybody. So. Um, and they advised um, talking to parents in an unbiased manner. So you just present them the information and then let them decide um, what they want to do. So um, I know we don't do them, but we do follow them up in clinic. So it's important to keep the scab from sticking to their diaper. And I know they're taught this in the nursery to keep Vaseline and gauze on it. Um, if it does get dirty, you know, if they poop or something in their diaper, just clean it with um, gauze and warm water. And after about three to five days, it should be fine. And they can, um, they can just leave it alone. Um, so we already talked about that they still have to kind of pull the skin back. So this is kind of a silly picture, but easy to remember. So this is what it will look like if there's <laughs> adhesions and this is what normal looks like. Okay, baby sleep. Or may maybe not sleeping. Um, so newborns sleep about 14 to 18 hours a day, um, but usually they won't sleep for longer than four hours in a stretch. Um, and they spend most of their time in REM sleep compared to an adult, which would be about 25% in REM sleep. Um, their average sleep cycle is 60 minutes, ours is 90. Um, and during REM sleep, the baby is active, kind of like we are, like you can act out your dreams in room sleep. So um, they can stretch and suck and make noise and dream and everything, but that doesn't mean they're awake or that they need to be fed or need to be picked up or anything. Um, and then in between their sleep cycles, they have partial awakenings. Um, so they're not fully awake. Um, and a lot of parents think they're, they are awake and they pick them up. But if you leave them alone, they'll go back into their next sleep cycle. Um, so they follow mom's circadian rhythm in utero. And then once they're born, they have to adjust to light like we do. So um, a lot of moms have issues with the day-night reversal. I just had one on Monday that said, my four-month-old sleeps all day, and when he wakes up at night to eat, he is wide awake and playing and wants to um, be awake. So the best way to fix this 
is to kind of keep the baby awake more during the day, if you can, and then to make it boring at night. And that mom said, oh, I do, t I do keep it boring. I just, I turn all the lights on, we just turn the TV on. I was like, that's not, it's like, that's, that's not what I meant. <laughs> um, so I don't know what, what their definition of excitement is. But, um, so at nighttime, it should be like, maybe just turn a lamp on if you need it. Um, minimal interaction, you know, just kind of feed them and then you go back to sleep. So it's not, it shouldn't be like a big thing in the middle of the night to wake up and eat. Um, and if they stick to that, it should get better in a couple of weeks. It takes time. Um, and we all know this, infants shouldn't sleep more than four hours, like newborns in the first week or two. Um, and then once they've regained their birth weight and have established breastfeeding, you can go a little bit longer, but really shouldn't go much longer than that. Um, and then sleep when the baby sleeps. This is mostly for the first couple of weeks. Um, that the mom shouldn't be doing laundry and dishes and all that when the baby's sleeping. She needs to rest too. Um, so older infants should sleep through the night about four months and sleeping through the night means six hours, not 12 hours. <laughs> Um, so that, it's important to ask when the parents say, oh yeah, they sleep through the night, like what time do they go to bed and what time do they wake up? Um, so there's an old wives tale about giving rice cereal to help them go to sleep and that's not true. I actually haven't heard anybody tell me that, but I just saw it when I was researching. Um, and if they're having trouble getting their infant to sleep, you can, um, the so infants have immature nervous systems, and so they need help to be soothed. And I'm talking about like, this is like up to four months old. Um, and usually sucking is the best way for them to self-soothe. Um, but you can also swaddle them, like seeing, going for a car ride, um, or just moving them around. And this does not spoil them. So. <laughs> um, so safe sleep, I know we know a lot of this, but um, little babies up to two to three months can sleep in a bassinet. Um, the AAP recommends room sharing to facilitate breastfeeding, but not bed sharing. So they can be in the bassinet next to your bed, but um, not in the bed. Um, so we all know about back to sleep. Babies should sleep on their back until they're about six months old, because 90% of SIDS cases occur at less than six months of age. Um, so they don't really know why this works, but just a hypothesis is that when they're on their bellies, they get like a pocket of CO2 around if there's like a blanket or the mattress or something like that. Um, and they don't have the neck muscles to move their head out of that. Um, so there's uh, some other protective factors for SIDS other than just back to sleep. Um, I thought this was interesting, room temperature. So the ideal room temperature is 68 degrees. Um, and there's more infant deaths in the wintertime when people have the heater on and it's stuffy. Um, and putting a fan on also helps just to like circulate the air. Um, you know, a lot of our patients tell us like the fan and the AC makes their baby sick, but it's actually protective. <laughs> um, smoking is a big thing. If the parents smoke, they're increased risk of SIDS. We all know no soft bedding, no bumpers or blankets or quilts or anything in the bed. All they need is a mattress with a sheet on it. Um, and then I thought this was very interesting, that pacifiers dramatically reduce the risk of SIDS. And they don't know why. Um, 
and even if they're low risk babies, if they're breastfed, non-smokers, their risk is decreased. And even if they do everything wrong, like if they have, if they bed share, they put them to sleep on their bellies, it still helps. So some people are against pacifiers sometimes, but appears to be very protective for sleep, which is interesting. Um, so here's the SIDS thing. I don't know how this works. Oh, here we go. So Back to Sleep was started in 1992, and it has dramatically decreased SIDS rates. So over the first year of life, their sleep is going to change. Um, so the, around two to four months, they're still sleeping most of the day. Um, they have a few naps during the day, but may start sleeping about six hours at night. Um, but this is still too early to start actually sleep training, but they can start setting up a routine. Um, babies like routines. So being consistent, making sure you put them to sleep in the same place at the same time, and doing all this before they're tired uh, is important. So four to six months, they start sleeping a little bit less and staying awake more during the day and sleeping more at night. So four months old, they start becoming more aware of their surroundings, and if the moms are rocking their baby to sleep and the baby falls asleep, and then they put them in the crib, they're aware of that. So they wake up, um, and then the parents get frustrated because their babies keep waking up when they put them down. Um, and then six to 12 months, they're sleeping a little bit less and much longer stretches at night. So if they're not sleeping six hours by six months, likely a parent issue. Um, and so we'll talk about that. So putting the baby in bed after they fall asleep, so they, it's okay to rock their baby, but they should put them down while they're sleepy before they actually fall asleep. Um, also staying in the room until they fall asleep, because as soon as you like close the door or something when you walk out, they're, they're going to wake back up. Um, it's also dis disorienting to them, so if you're in one room rocking them or if you're in the room when they fall asleep and then they wake up and they're somewhere else or you're not in the room, that's disorienting, so they kind of, um, they'll cry. Um, train nighttime feedings, I feel like we see this a lot. That, um, they're feeding at the same time every night, and they're just trained to wake up every night at that time to eat. So they're creatures of habit, and that's just, if you train them to do that, that's what will happen. Um, inconsistent schedules. So the more routine, the better, which is really hard for our patient population when they're bouncing around to grandma's and the aunt's house, and all of that, but the more they can schedule things, the better. And if there's activities or something like that, they should schedule it around the baby, not the other way around. Um, so they shouldn't skip their nap time or push their bedtime back because there's something going on um, that can cause them to be overtired. And when they're overtired, it's even harder to get them to sleep. Um, so. Some moms, when their baby cries, they bring the baby into bed with them, and they will learn that when they cry, they get to go in bed with the parents. And so then they'll start expecting that. Um, so the, both parents need to decide what they're going to do and stick to it. Um, and it's important for babies to learn how to self-soothe. It's not mean to let them cry for a little while. And usually by six months, they are able to do that. Um, and ap around that time, you can spoil them. So um, the 
grandmas are right sometimes. You can't spoil your baby. Um, so there's lots of different, I didn't go into all of these, there's lots of different sleeping methods. Um, and they tell you, like, put your baby down and then go away and then come back, check on them if they cry, but don't talk to them. There's all kinds of different methods, and they can kind of pick one and stick to it. <laughs> Bowel movements. I think this comes up at every well child visit. So um, we all know newborn babies should pass their meconium in the first 24 hours. Um, so it's very important to know what normal poop looks like. Um, breastfed babies are going to have watery, yellow, seedy poop with almost every feed. And a lot of times the moms think that their baby's having diarrhea, but it's really just normal baby poop. And breast milk is digested so easily and moves through the intestines so fast, so that's why it's more watery. Um, so how do they know if it really is diarrhea? They're pooping a lot more than usual. Um, so formula-fed babies, it's going to be more of like a green paste, but thicker because it takes longer to digest, and they absorb more water as it's moving through. And they can have less frequent stools. Um, it can be three to four times a day, or it can be every few days. And so as they start adding solid foods, it's going to start looking more like solid Um, so, I didn't want to put actual poop pictures. So. Um, this is yellow seedy, and this is green paste. So, some common issues um, that parents say that their baby's grunting and straining, it's really hard for them to poop. Um, it's actually totally normal for them to grunt and strain because they're laying down, which is it's hard to poop laying down. Um, a lot of parents freak out when their baby hasn't pooped in 24 hours. Um, and they say that their baby's constipated, and that's not the definition of constipated. So constipation is the firmness if it's really hard, um, but not the frequency. So, um, And also if they add rice cereal that can cause them to poop less frequently. Um, and you can recommend high fiber cereal or fruits or prune juice or anything like that. Um, colored stool always freaks parents out, but usually it's just from artificial food coloring. Um, blue poop is usually from juice. And there's different food, like beets can cause red stool that's not blood. Um, and then potty training. Um, every now and then I have a mom that tells me, like, their six-month-old is potty trained. And so it's a developmental milestone that has to come in order with the other milestones. Um, for girls, it's usually around two and a half years, and boys, it's three to three and a half years. So this young, they shouldn't be, be potty trained. Um, some things to worry about, uh, meconium ileus, obviously, if they have blood in their stool, it can be bright red or um, you know, black tarry stools or even mixed with mucus. Current jelly stool for interception. If you don't know what current jelly looks like, this is what it looks like. And that's what current jelly stool looks like too, if you Google it. Um, so diarrhea, if they're having like a dramatic increase in their stool output, you don't want them to get dehydrated. Um, acolic stool or bulky, foul-smelling stools. Um, and just a heads up, Pepto-Bismol causes stool to turn black, and they shouldn't be giving infants Pepto-Bismol, but you never know. So just in case they gave that, that could be why their baby stool is dark. Reflux. 
So two-thirds of normal babies spit up. Um, and it's just because they have transient relaxation of their lower esophageal sphincter, and that's normal for them. Um, GERD, where they actually have like complications associated with it, is much more rare than we think it is. Um, you usually don't need any testing. You can just diagnose this by HMP. Um, and we just recommend lifestyle modifications. So if they're breastfeeding, um, they can try a maternal um, exclusion diet and see if there's something that mom's eating that's causing more frequent spit-ups or um, they have milk protein allergy, can change their formula. And reducing the volume and increasing the frequency of feeds helps. And so right, we know adding rice cereal helps. Um, it actually just prevents it from coming up. So it's still, they still reflux, you just don't see it. Which sometimes the moms appreciate when they don't have to change their baby's clothes every time they feed them. Um, and then keeping them upright for a little while after their feeds. And then you can reassure the moms that by about six months they should be getting better. Um, so if they do have GERD, um, PPIs are actually not approved by the FDA um, and have not been shown to have any benefit over placebo anyway. Um, so if you're treating um, if you're treating a toddler after one year of age, you can it's important to dose it at the right time, 30 minutes before they eat for the maximal effect. And then obviously, if nothing else is working, you can try Nissen, but um, there's high morbidity and, and risk, and the parents need to be very thoroughly counseled about um, the realistic expectations. They still can spit up, they still can aspirate. Um, it's not just like a magic cure. Um, and then some worrisome things, if they're having projectile vomiting, bilious vomiting, blood or coffee ground emesis. Um, morning, like first thing in the morning, vomiting is associated with increased ICP, um, which is worrisome. And if they have a bulging fontanelle, they could have meningitis and then sunken if they're really dehydrated. Teething. So the first tooth pops up from six to 12 months, um, and it's very, it varies a lot. So um, if they have a 12 month old that doesn't have teeth yet, it's probably coming soon. They don't need to worry about it too much. Um, so usually the first teeth are the, bot the bottom two. And then this little chart has different months on it, but it can really be kind of random how the other teeth come in. Um, and drool is, I've heard this before, that when they start drooling, that means their teeth are coming in. Um, but they're drooling because they're preparing to eat solid foods, not necessarily their teeth. So things that are not caused by teething, um, fever, diarrhea, runny nose, anything else that I've heard all kinds of stuff that has been blamed on teething um, it doesn't cause any of that. When they are older, like 12 to 18 months and their molars are coming in, it can, they can kind of pull at their ears, so that's kind of the only thing to watch out for. Um, Tylenol is good, and like teething rings, or you can, they can freeze like a dish rag, and they can kind of like chew on that, but um, teething gels and the homeopathic tablets that who knows what's in them and the amber teething necklaces are not recommended and I'm surprised that they just now are say, saying that the amber teething necklaces, necklaces are um, not good. They're choking hazard, they're, if they fall apart they can choke on the little beads and 
just the string, like while they're sleeping, can choke them. Oops. So um, discipline is very important, um, and it's hard to talk to moms about because they're, you don't want to tell them how to raise their kid, but you do want to give them information how to not abuse their child. Um, so avoiding any aversive disciplinary measures, any that's hitting, yelling, anything that's not positive, I guess. Um, and it's, it's been shown that it does, some of that helps minimally in the short term, but is, has negative outcomes long term. So most of that is not useful. Um, and they have an increased risk of negative outcomes as they get older. And so the AAP recommends avoiding all kinds of physical punishment or verbal abuse in kids. So some effective strategies, um, if they can teach, first of all, you need an adult that is engaged and willing to work with the child. Um, so you have to encourage the parents to do this, um, but you want them to start kind of regulating their own behavior, um, teach them things that keep them from hurting themselves and that enhance their functioning skills and the best thing is reinforcing acceptable behavior. Um, kids respond really well to positive reinforcement. And so timeouts work. Um, there's a study that they did that showed um, that pediatricians could teach parents how to use timeouts effectively in one clinic visit. So um, they're they're effective and they work well. And then reinforcing good behavior and providing resources for families. Um, like the AAP website has a lot of um, discipline um, help on there. And there's other websites too. I fixed the until. <laughs> they spelled until wrong, so I had to fix it. So that's it. Any questions or anything? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So how in the uh, routine, well, maybe exams or visits, how do you incorporate this uh, anticipatory guidance into to those visits? Is there a key on what the parents are interested in, or do you sort of develop a uh, routine that um, you would use and then focus on based on parent response? I think it's hard to incorporate all of this into one visit unless you have like a little speech you can do like while you're doing your exam or something. Um, but especially like for sleep or something, if they have questions about it, you can counsel them on that. And then um, I know a lot of times when we're talking about discipline and stuff, it's because we see the mom hit the kid in the clinic and we talk to them. <laughs> so when the opportunities come up, we can do some counseling. Other questions or comments? Well, you can see that there's lots of information about all of the things that parents need to address for healthy children as they develop. And, and I think that you, and you primary care physician really have a great opportunity to give them advice and to help them understand how to identify what's needed at certain developmental ages so that it can be appropriate. Um, so I, I think this is really an important part of what primary care physicians, particularly pediatricians and family practitioners can do uh, to help families. And I, I think it's a really important part of, the, of what you need to learn so you can intervene appropriately at the right developmental time. Okay.
other comments? That could be into it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.